Well, there we go. I just drove home this morning from uh, Michigan, from Battle Creek. How long a drive was that, Adam? Too long. Too long. <laughs> Michigan to Nashville, huh? <laughs> How's that? I don't know. It seemed to be about eight hours. Oh. All right. So I will not whine about driving home from Montreal today. It's here in New Hampshire. It was a measly four and a half. I think it was 15 from uh, um, from Worcester to here. Yeah, you win. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't really trying to compete, but <laughs> Actually, it was, you it was significant, significantly longer when you add the uh, hour waiting for a tow truck and then the <laughs> fact that we had to limp into Bangor and spend the night there on Sunday. So Destination Bangor, Maine? Yeah. We weren't even in the third box car. All right, well, let's get things rolling. Uh, welcome, everybody, as usual, to our monthly webinar. Very excited to have you here. Um, as you know, this month's guest speaker is Adam. Adam Scott, mm -hmm. our society staff member. What's your official title, Adam? I, I made up a whole lot of words that sound impressive, but is that, does that look right to you, society staff member? Actually, that's exactly right. Nice. <laughs> and... Uh, Oh, I meant to put your, your email address there. He's a scott at barbershop.org. Yes, sir. As everyone scrambles to take notes. <laughs> um, let me quick uh, go over some quick uh, uh, news happenings that's been going on here in the NED before we turn it over to, to Adam and any uh, discussion we want to have tonight. Um, just got back, as we said, from Montreal. We had a wonderful CDWI yesterday, uh, hosted by the South Shore chapter. Uh, our clinicians were Terry Reynolds from the Alexandria Harmonizers and Sean Milligan from down the Sunshine District. Uh, we had a wonderful day. The morning, if you've never been part of a CDWI course, director's workshop intensive. The morning is spent uh, with the clinicians discussing with uh, the, the directors uh, their, their mission, their, their, uh, their obstacles, and determining what things they want to work on in the afternoon when they have a, a chorus come and sing and basically do conducting lab for the whole afternoon. You identify a couple of issues you want to work on, uh, and we record you in front of the chorus, and uh, the clinicians take turns uh, going over the recordings with you throughout the afternoon. And uh, we had a blast. The, uh, the, the South Shore Saints happened to have four directors who were all participants, and South Shore Saints were the, were the lab chorus. So it was kind of cool. It was a little, uh, a little extra exciting because we didn't have to sing Polecats all day. They could do their, their chorus rep and work with their own directors, and we didn't have to you know, feel each other out during the day and, and, and figure anything out. It was, uh, it was all business as usual, uh, and it was neat to see them uh, – uh, in action and helping each other learn and grow, and it was, it was a really neat, really neat day. Uh, so thank you to South Shore for putting that on, and thank you to Terry and Sean for coming up and being such awesome, awesome clinicians. Really, really top notch. Uh, if if uh, any of you out there listening, uh, either tuning in live or or on the YouTube's, are interested in uh, having a CDWI here in the NED again this year or or next year. Please let me know. I'd love to organize another. If I have more money in the budget this year, we can try and pull another one off. Uh, if not, we'll, we'll do one, certainly one or two next year, because this was uh, this was an amazing day. Glad to, glad to have them happening again here in the NED. Have uh, Russell or Scott, have you ever been to a CDWI? No, I'm a little nervous about it. I have. Yeah? Yeah, yeah I did one. Um, where was it? It was in... Uh... It was in upstate New York. Um, it wasn't Saratoga, but it was sort of near-ish to that. Yeah. And what was your experience with that? Did you have a, a... It was great. It was a blast. And uh, uh, less, um, less, 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 less. The guy who directs a pole cut at every Harmony U general session, Adam, what's his name? Okay. Less. Yeah. <laughs> That's the guy. Anyway, he did the CDWI with me. Great. Or for oh. me. He, he was the guy that did it. So it was great. It was a terrific day. Lots of fun. 
excellent. Yeah, it, it, it is fun and it's great to be uh, the student for a change and have someone work with you on, on the things that you need to work on as a director. Uh, we're so often wrapped up in you know, helping the chorus that we don't often have the chance to reflect or even have someone help us. So it's a, it's a great day uh, for a director to have some, some one-on-one lessons. Great stuff. Great stuff. And uh, uh, Scott, hopefully we can have one in our area and you can check it out because it's, uh, it's great stuff. Sure. Uh, speaking of Scott, we had uh, uh, the Dover chapter and the Concord, New Hampshire chapter got together uh, last week for a little fun. You want to talk about that? Uh, yeah, it was great uh, singing with a larger chorus because we, we usually only get about uh, 10 to 12 on an average Thursday night. And uh, so being able to direct a room of what we have, 40, 50 people, yeah. that was uh, fun for me. Yeah. Went by really fast. It did, it did. And we uh, we learned a song together. We did uh, some polecats together. Uh, and we even had our district champion quartet come and sing for us. Uh, Timepiece was going to be going to the uh, the Harmony Sweeps uh, National Finals coming up in May. So uh, it, was, it was cool to have them right in our backyard. They took time out of their day to come uh, sing for us. It was very cool. Yeah, the guys from Dover were still talking about it uh, last week. Nice, nice. Mine too. So we'll do it again sometime. We'll crash your rehearsal next week. Yeah, we were throwing that around. <laughs> Sounds like fun. Coming up uh, coming up this summer is uh, Harmony College Northeast. If you haven't already registered, make sure you do. Uh, there's the website there, anydistrict.org slash HCNE. And uh, block out that weekend because there's a lot of good stuff happening for directors as well. Um, hopefully your chapter can send you down there. We've got Terry Ludwig and uh, Richie Levine and uh, Don Rose are going to be uh, staff members there. So we're really looking forward to that. And I hope you can make it. It's going to be a lot of fun. So, Mr. Adam. Yes, sir. If, uh, if you guys don't know, Adam is uh, obviously our society staff member and, uh, and an accomplished uh, quartet-er because he just qualified for Pittsburgh. Eha. Congratulations. Huzzah. Huzzah, indeed. Uh, and also uh, an educator and arranger and composer in his own right. So we are we are uh, blessed to have him here with us, sharing his talents and, and time with us, especially after having spent eight hours in the car and to just get out of the car and uh, be with us again. So thank you for devoting more of your time today to barbershop, and please thank your family for us. Uh, My first yeah. lesson for Adam. Three hours in the car is much easier than coming back home with fussy twins. The twins are picking my butt today. Uh, oh. so my first question for Adam to get the ball rolling is: Now that you are a father of four sons, how often do they rehearse, and do they ever, and do you arrange for them? <laughs> <laughs> how old are the twins? Uh, about six weeks old. Wow. Yes, they are spitter number one and spitter number two. <laughs> Good stuff. So uh, I, I know I have some things on my list for, for to go through tonight, but Adam, I'll let you uh, get things started. If you have uh, some topics you want to talk about with us, uh, and we'll, uh, we'll just sort of let the conversation happen organically as we go. So Adam, you want to get the ball rolling? Yeah. So uh, one thing is, is, has actually been pressing on my mind. Um, and it comes as a result of coaching the chorus this uh, this last Monday, uh, and it's, it has to do with show them rather than tell them. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think as chorus directors, we have such precious little time to get done what we want to get done in any given meeting that we have. We've got two and a half hours, three hours tops a week to learn music. That's not to say that all the other things that are going on during a chapter meeting, business, notes, other things, there's just a lot of gabbing. And if you are like me, you you lord over and you hoard your your director podium time because there's just not very much of it. And depending on if guys come prepared or semi-prepared or they need you to help them get prepared for their music, uh, it can be a lot to get even four or five to six or seven new songs learned every year. Uh, to say nothing of Christmas repertoire and show repertoire and, and different things that are going on in your chapters. So 
just my concept has to do with uh, I watched a, a director. He's a good director. He knows what he's doing. Constantly saying you need to do. Uh, he'll, he'd stop the course and he'd say, "Okay, you guys need to do this. This isn't happening, and and, and try this this time." And um, I very politely gave the section leaders uh, 30 seconds to talk, and I challenged him to when he cuts off the chorus to just start again and see if he could show rather than just tell what he wants the chorus to do. So I, I think uh, using using the gesture is can be much more effective than saying something. Uh, if, if you start the chorus and the chorus comes in with a kind of karunk or uh, a wishy-washy entrance, stop the chorus and just start again. You don't have to say anything, just kind of stop. Maybe you could say one word close and then start again. Your chorus will know or will learn very quickly what it is that you intend to do or what it is that you want them to pick up on rather than stopping and saying, well, we stopped because the lead scooped and the baritones are flat and the bass is ugly. Uh, so, but rather than getting in the hang of, or in the in the habit of stopping and saying, "Well, that was bad," or stopping and saying, "Well, we could improve upon this," we stop and say, "That was close. Let's do it again." Or stop and say, "Leads 10% higher," and start again. Or stop and say, "Baritones wrong placement." And by and large, our guys pretty well know how to fix what we want them to fix. Mm -hmm. I think we have a tendency to not give them enough credit that by not very long, it wouldn't take him very long to pick up on our nonverbal communication of, you know, if I'm making eye contact with you, it's because your, your face is, is uh, not in the game right now, or what have you, rather than needing to stop and start so many times. There's a concept of seven words or less. I don't know if you can use this or not, but I hereby challenge you at your next course rehearsal to try this concept called seven words or less. And what it is, is when you cut your chorus off, you have seven words to speak. And after seven words, you have to start your chorus again. And it's a tall order. It's tough to do. Or give yourself a half an hour. You know, I want to work on this song, and I'm going to work on this song for a half an hour with my chorus. Uh, and I want to be able to do so in a focused uh, manner that shows my guys that I'm serious, I'm prepared, I want to help them work, I want to help them better what they do. Uh, and I'm going to only use seven words when we stop. Does that concept make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. Makes sense. Uh, I think you're right. It's not going to be easy, but it makes sense. No, it, it's not easy. It's definitely not easy the first time you do it. Uh, I, I gave this concept to um, the... I had the opportunity to go to the Netherlands this earlier this year. And I gave them this seven words or less, and they said, I don't think you can do that. I don't think that's possible. And I said, challenge accepted. Mm -hmm. And for the next, like, 15 minutes, we worked on a song. And it was one of the common core um, songs that they had in their packet for that week. And we worked on the song, and we did it with, in the seven seconds or less. And they so I started to kind of see head nods of people buying into it, going, yeah, that is possible. Yeah, I could actually do that. Um, if you're uncomfortable with that, if you're not quite ready to try that, try one other way. Try having your assistant director or your chorus manager or someone in your chorus um, hold a stopwatch and say, as we work on this song, every time we stop, every time I stop the chorus, I want you to start your timer. And then when I stop talking, I want you to click it again. And I want you to judge. I want you to see how much time you are, not necessarily wasting, but how much time you are talking. Because I think most directors, when they find out how much talking they're doing in rehearsal, they're like, wow, they become a, a little bit appalled, a little bit distressed by how much they are speaking and telling rather than showing. When the power of the gesture is generally much more effective communicator than the power of your words. Because you might try and explain a vocal thing to a guy who needs to see it rather than hear it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So there's the sermon on the couch. Yeah, I think we get wrapped up as directors in our own, you know, maybe I'll say the word, I'll say the E word, our own ego, whether we realize it or not, uh, that we need to expound knowledge and pour the knowledge into them uh, when we can just do so so much more efficiently just by saying, again, directing it a little better or directing it more clearly. I knew a director who had uh, vocal surgery, vocal nodules removed 
and could not speak mm -hmm. uh, and by doctor's orders could not speak right and that's tough that's really hard you talk about not being able to talk not being able to talk at all yeah. would be very hard uh, or those of you who married uh, you know what I'm talking about uh, but uh, when you can't speak you are forced to make your gesture be awesome your gesture be amazing because that's the only way you can show your course what you want And a lot of times that will help us, I find, uh, sort of reflect upon our own conducting gesture, our own clarity. And I'll say, all right, uh, sorry, maybe let me conduct that this way. And that's all you need to do. Yeah, I might stop my chorus and then start again and fix it and say, let's do it one more time. And I may fix something I did. Now, I may not tell my chorus that necessarily, but I, I may fix or change the way I'm gesticulating a baritone entrance or... Um, or a forward motion in the piece because maybe one way didn't work or maybe one way needs to be connected in the brain for a different guy and he needs a different gesture to illustrate that same connectivity. Yep. So that can help immensely in save not only, first of all, saving time in your rehearsal but also in becoming a better conductor, better communicator and uh, getting your product out faster and in a more enjoyable rehearsal environment. Enjoyable is a good thing, I thought that's fine. <laughs> sort of leads into one of the things I had written down, Adam, was uh, the, the, we talked about it this weekend in, in uh, the CDWI, is the topic of quote-unquote riser discipline and, and things things that you can do to, to have, have good riser discipline. Is that, is that maybe the right, the right term? But, you know, keep guys from uh, talking amongst themselves or, or things like that. So... Uh, tell me some, some, some tricks up your sleeve, Adam, and then we'll maybe go around the room and share. I, I know some of the ones you did at Leadership Academy were, were very effective, uh, and, I, and I enjoyed stealing those already. Where to go? <laughs> Anybody there? What? In seven words or less, or you just say section leader fix that. Ah, excellent. So, one thing that I do in my chorus. I have uh, I have a really excellent section leaders. In fact, two of my section leaders are also my assistant directors. So uh, I've got the advantage of, of having four guys that I can trust to fix notes. So what I generally do is I say, if, if there are wrong notes or if there are gaping holes in sections, I'll stop and say, section leaders take 30. And they know what that means is they've got 30 seconds to fix whatever burning desires they have, and then they can plow on. What if their burning desires aren't your burning desires? <laughs> Fair point. And just for, I mean, an example, like, really get together and decide what the. I would say bases at the chorus, and I would start. Okay. And when we encounter the wrong note, we hold, we freeze, we fix, and they say. Once more, please. We can, but we can do that very quickly. Or staccato notes, please. Yeah. Or um, basses at the chorus, no words, only do. And then we get to the we get to the point where we're isolating notes. We're only focusing on that one particular thing. We're removing all the other variables because the notes aren't there. Or if we need to isolate the tone quality, or we need to isolate pitch, uh, leads at the verse with me, please. Okay, checkpoint, pitch pipe. One more time, please. Okay, one more time, checkpoint, pitch pipe. Leads. Get your craft together, or you know, whatever you need, whatever you need to say to 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 get the leads back on top of the pitch, or say leads on the top of the pitch, or leads. Do it again. I I dare you to go sharp. Uh, but we can do so in ways to say leads. We're consistently singing below the pitch. Can you hear it? Let's hear the pitch pipe. You know. That starts to sound a little bit more naggy rather than 
shorter words make make us uh, inspire our guys and give confidence to our guys that hey, do I trust the leads to be able to sing on the pitch? And if I have to stop and lecture them about it, well then they they're going to get an understanding and the feeling that I don't trust them to be able to come in on the pitch. But if we stop and say leads, that pitch pipe is beating you, and then we start again. I don't really I don't need to say anything else. I challenge them that an that an inanimate object is now beating them. You're getting beat by a, you're getting beat by a cheap pitch pipe right now. And that you know, and they'll kind of giggle and laugh. But when we start again, their focus is on top of that, mm -hmm. and they'll get on top of that. And uh, what what you could do is you could write down in your mind or on paper your five most common reasons for stopping your chorus, and then challenge yourself to be able. How could I fix that in seven words or less? What could I do to to stop and start uh, to start making music? as fast as possible. That's really all this is about. This is about giving more time back to you at the end of rehearsal. Those are great, and I, and I totally stole your uh, section Leaders Take 30 thing the, the week after Leadership Academy, uh, and I hope, uh, Russell, you did too, because that was, that was awesome. I, yeah, I have done it. Um, they, some of the section leaders found it tricky um, trying to talk to their section while the other sections were all making noise. Mm -hmm. Especially if they were singing and they wanted to fix a part in the middle and they couldn't find their notes because the other sections were singing different parts. Yeah, um, Yeah. But, sometimes there's a brutal cacophony going on there and lately it seems like whenever I give section leaders 30, the tenors, there's only two of them so they start texting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you, you know, you kind of work on that. You figure stuff out. The the baritone might want to say something about tone quality, and the bass section leader has a burning desire to eradicate the wrong notes. But you kind of, um, the, I think that after the cacophony fixes itself, I think it's that can be a very effective way to fix four things at once. Mm -hmm. That's right on the top of the list because often, as a as a chorus director, I'm not hearing individual notes. I had a bass section leader come up to me and say. Adam, I'm hearing wrong notes. And I said, I'm not. I have a pretty good ear, so it must not be very flagrant. And he said, no, it's killing me. I'm hearing wrong notes. I'm like, I would like, I would rather you focused on artistry in your section leaders rather than note beating because nobody likes note beating. I would rather somebody make a bold, large, blatant mistake mm -hmm. than sneakily going through their songs in timidity and, and you know, wimping their way through things. So I said, I want your guys to be bold. I would rather you guys made mistakes and worked on artistry rather than, you know, lower level note beating. Does that make sense? And he was like, well, yeah. I was like, well, why don't you try it for a couple of weeks and see how it goes? And if nothing else, the morale in the bass section now is much better than it used to be. I have a couple of guys that say I much more enjoy singing bass in this new style rather than, you know, the note Nazi. And I I, I hate using the word Nazi, but that's that's their words, not mine. How how our base section was referred to. But when the basses tend to sing like a whole part of a song, just an octave below the melody, <laughs> or two octaves below the melody, you know, you do kind two of. Two octaves want... below the melody. <laughs> I'm kidding, but <laughs> if Most... the tenor has the melody, if the tenor has the melody, the basses might sing it two octaves below the melody. Mm. Mm, you know what I would do? Fire the bass? No, what, what would you do? <laughs> yeah, shoot a bass every time there's an accident. The uh, accidents go way down. Yeah. No, what I would generally do is I would isolate. I would say, let's try that again, just basses and tenors. Actually, I could even use less words. I would say, basses and tenors at the chorus, or wherever the problem is. Ah, okay, right there. Can you hear that we're making parallel octaves? All right, let's try that one more time. Yeah, and one more time, we're making wrong notes. Can you hear where those wrong notes are? Do we need to have a section leader? Do we need to have a sectional to, fi to fix this, to, to figure this out? So we can't have this double, we can't have this octavation. I'm not sure if octavation is a, is a word. You're octavating me. I like it. Uh, <laughs> but that's, that's, see, that's unacceptable. You are not singing your part. So we either need to stop the singing this song right now and move to the next song, or we need to fix it right now. So which would you rather us do? And I might make it. I might make it that bold right there and then in chorus, because or or say, um, okay, let's let's work on just the lead sound right now. And I would work on that for five minutes, and I would say, excellent, thank you very much. Let's move to the next piece. 
because we we can't let the the neurons be connected into making uh, wrong notes an acceptable pattern of behavior mm -hmm. because it's so much harder to unlearn something than it is to, to you know to get something fresh. That's why a lot of choruses when they start getting better they have to not sing the songs that they sang when they first started singing. Yep. There are a lot, in fact there are a lot of choruses that are that sing polecats very very infrequently or in gang singing or after chapter rehearsal rather than during rehearsal because uh, so many of us know our, our polecats so well that it's hard to craft or work on a polecat with any degree of effectiveness because we're on autopilot. We could sing, we could almost sing those those songs absolutely backwards. That's why when you see like hotshot barber stoppers standing around in a circle, they can play snaps and they can literally switch parts and keep singing the same dang polecat because there's, I mean, there's, we're just on autopilot. Yeah, I, I tell them that they uh, reach into their barbershop jukebox and press B17, and that pops my wild Irish rose. Yeah. Yeah, my chorus does not sing that particular tune. Uh, however, I would say that the the concept of the polecat and having a core repertoire, in fact, uh, I think very few choruses, very few districts are better at it than your district is, because many of you know uh, the Boston Common Charts, which are... I, I call them polecats. In my chorus, uh, What a Wonderful World is a polecat. That's one of our common core charts that everybody knows that we could sing at the drop of a hat. If it gets to the point where that song becomes stale, then it's time to find a new piece. But what my chorus does is at the end of our focus warm-up and the end of our vocal warm-up, we'll go into our starter song and we sing What a Wonderful World. And that's kind of our checkpoint. Are we singing in our core default song, default sound? And if we are, then cool, awesome. And if not, then we need to revisit some things. And if at any point during rehearsal where things start to kind of fall apart or get lazy or lackadaisical or, or just we're making inaccuracies or falling into old habits, then we'll, I say, go back to What a Wonderful World for just a minute. Let's just reestablish and, and connect to the core sound, and then we can come back into and work on the song. And, and that's... I think that's a, that's a good thing. If you've got a tune that, that you guys know that you guys really like, that's really not have a, a, a terrible, crazy tessitura to it, that's just good, comfortable barbershop song, then use that as your kind of core model song so that when things start to kind of go awry, you can go revisit that piece and just kind of reset or realign how things are. I like that idea. I've, I've been, over the years, I've growing in the habit of uh, doing a longer, longer warm-up to, to get to the core sound that we need to establish for the night. Uh, and I think that, that goes to that point right there. Where if we can get that and guard that and protect that and keep it there all night, uh, that's, that's, that's good stuff. And if it goes away, like you said, we come back and we, we, do some, we go back to that piece or we do the warm-ups again or something like that to get that core sound back because that's worth protecting. Yeah. Yeah, generally in, in warm-up, I work on focus, I work on energy, I work on tuning fourths and fifths, and sometimes some unison singing, but I'm, I'm working on core sound rather than necessarily saying, okay, we're going to go... You know, doing a set, uh, uh, harmonic drills or drilling, or uh, my, 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 my. My 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 my. All that just does is just that just bores us. That just gets us to turn off. Yep. As much as possible, if we can make that that first piece of the of the rehearsal dynamic and engaging and moving, then we get, you know, if it's gonna bore me, it's gonna bore the guy next to me. <laughs> and I gotta think, how can I keep everybody engaged? How can I keep the focus and the energy and the drive into my warm up? How can I make my warm-up actually harder than I make my song? Then I make our first song, so that when we get to that point, then it's then it's you know, then it's comfortable, then it's then it's relaxed, and our energy level is up, and we're engaged, and we're ready to sing, we're ready to make some music, rather than running the same drills every week after week. Uh, the chorus I've, I coached on Monday, this this last Monday, they do the same warm-up every week, and you can see. But there are like five people that walk in the door after warm-ups running because guess what? 
They've seen that warm up. Mm-hmm. So it's you know it's it's autopilot. Yep. They don't even want to come to do it. They want to they want to come fashionably late. You know maybe so maybe one guy's a lawyer or he's a chef or something and he's he's coming in late, and you know that we get that we understand that. But if you got you know the same type of crowd who is perpetually late to your rehearsals because guess what, your warm up isn't dynamic and engaging, or maybe it's too long. If we got a two and a half hour rehearsal. Do most of you have about that? About a two and a half hour rehearsal? Danny, you have a three hour rehearsal? No. Uh, we go, actually, two, we used to go three. 2.45. How's that? Yeah, so, I mean, if you've if you got a two hour rehearsal, or a two and a half hour, three hour rehearsal, and you're spending 20 minutes of warm up, 30 minutes, I've seen courses that spend 30 minutes warming up. Good gravy. What are you doing in 30 minutes of warm up? A high school concert choir that meets for one hour? If you spent half that much time or that amount of time uh, proportional to it, you would make very little music. Mm-hmm. They spent five minutes tops on the warm-up. I know another uh, music director who says, we don't do warm-ups. You come to, the expectation is you come to rehearsal ready to sing. Warm-ups are a waste of time. Uh, mixed bag on that. I don't know which where you have to find out where your chorus lies on that, but... If your chorus is the same warm-up every week after week, then guess what? It might be a waste of time. If your chorus changes, if your warm-up changes every week, if you're constantly feeding your guys every week, then it's it's engaging, it's fun. I used to sing with the Music City Chorus, and uh, any time Sean Devine was going to do his focus warm-up, I would always go. I was I would make it a point to not miss his warm-up because guess what? It was different every time. It was dynamic. It was engaging. It was interesting. And I didn't know what he was going to do next. Now, that may be because he didn't know what he was going to do next either. But I have the suspicion that those warm-ups were thought of ahead of time. They were planned. They were calculated. They were focused on what the... They were They were led by what was going to be happening later in the rehearsal. So guess what? If we're working on a song that's devilishly tricky, that's that's very harmonically driven, yeah, I'm going to use a harmonic warm-up. If we're using a song that has a very lyrical, uh, beautiful, um, frolicking melody, then I'm, I'm going to use an accuracy exercise, or I'm going to use a connectivity exercise. If I've got one, you know, it's like case in point, but I'm leading the warm-up into what's going to be happening in that song. So if we're working on uh, All I Do Is Dream Of You, or some other kind of uh, rhythmically sneaky song, I might start with uh, a rhythmic clapping exercise, or I might start with some syncopation exercises to get us all thinking on the same page and making sure that we can keep tempo and yet make the rhythms that are going to come later in the night sizzle and really come together. And if there's a particularly tricky rhythmic pattern in the song, I'm going to use it as a warm-up exercise without pitches so that when we get to that part in the song, I can go, oh, Wait, wait, wait. That's that's almost like it was in the warm-up. It's almost like we planned it that way. You know, and I may make sport of it and, and kind of laugh it about it. But that's the point, is is leading your rehearsal based on your warm-up. I'm monologuing. Am I droning on? No, it's perfect. It, it goes exactly into what uh, I was thinking about talking about next, which was uh, rehearsal planning. How much, how much do you tend to do, and how detailed do you get on a week-to-week uh, rehearsal plan basis, Adam? See how we planned that? That was perfect, Eric. Nice lead in. Thanks. <laughs> so rehearsal planning, that's that's the topic of discussion? Yeah. I think every rehearsal needs to have a song you know really well, a song that you kind of know, and a song that you don't know very well. Now, if you are like my chorus, my chorus tends to spend a lot of its learning energies right at the beginning. So if we've got a song that we're working on, I might start, I might just run one song, and then I might dive right into a song that we're working on that we need to sink our teeth into and spend a lot of our mental mental acuity on right away, right up front. Yeah. So that way when we have, um, when we're, we're trying to learn tricky patterns and rhythm or we're trying to in, introduce stage presence to a song, that we, we do so early on in the pacing of the rehearsal so that by the time... After break, after coffee, after quartets, hey, let's learn this new song. So I find that if we're learning new material, do that, front load that in the rehearsal. 
Uh, beyond that, I think if you don't give your guys something to, to work through, to work on, and something that you can just run. I mean, everyone's been to the rehearsals where you've got to do one or the other. You've got to run a show, or you've got to you've got to really beat the crap out of one song. You're going to spend all night on two songs. My chorus can spend all night on two songs and be okay with that occasionally. My chorus can spend a night just running show sets and be okay with that. But all the time, one or the other becomes very taxing. So I find that I tend to pace my rehearsal as I would pace a show. I generally would start with something that that uh, has a, more of a tempoed piece, a tempoed environment, and then run through things in, in a medium tempo and then a ballad tempo and then right back to energy level so that I keep my guys' energy pacing and keep that, keep that energy level moving and keep it up rather than, uh, let's see if I can think of how to say this nicely. There was a quartet in Nashville, and I can't remember their name, but for contest they learned four ballads. And I think you can already see in your head where this is going, but they they got to the point where they were kind of known for singing their ballads in the chorus. So one night as they're getting up to sing, my cousin Shane Scott says, I wonder what lovely riveting uh, up-tempo this quartet is going to favor us with this evening. And everybody kind of chuckled, but the point was taken that you, know, you can't find yourself singing only one or the other. If you rehearse three up tunes all night long, that's a that's a pretty grueling pace. That's kind of tough to do. Point taken? Very much. So pacing the rehearsal like you would pace the show. Front load your your stuff that you're learning right away rather than putting that after the break. And then making sure you have at least a few songs that you can run every week. Uh, so that there's the biggest lie directors tell us, okay, we're going to run this song without stopping. Uh, and we can fall into that, that trap of, of uh, just beating the tar out of a couple songs. Uh, one other thing I would say is that uh, guys are, are pretty substantially visual creatures. Uh, and being able to see the plan written down either ahead of time via email or on a giant whiteboard in your rehearsal hall goes a long way for, for guys and particularly for guests. You've got a guest that's coming. If you have a guest folder, a uh, guest binder, what have you, then you can say, hey, there, look at the board. Those are the songs. Put the songs in that order when you get there or even for your members. Put the songs in that order rather than, okay, uh, next we're going to do uh, song Y. Okay, get that out. And it takes like, you know, 90 seconds, two minutes, two and a half minutes, five minutes for you to just hunt down that sheet music in your folder. Oh, can I borrow your copy? Oh, mine's in my car. Oh, I left mine at home in her peanut butter sandwich. So you've got all guys that just hunt for music. Rather than the guy walks in the door, he sees the whiteboard, he pulls out his binder, he puts those songs in that order, and then he's ready to go. And then I can say, okay, thanks, excellent work on that song. Okay, next song. Boom, pitch, boom, song. And we've We've shown respect to the guys by pacing the, the rehearsal and showing you this is what we're going to do, this is how long we're going to do it, this is when we're going to start the song. And I might put, all I do is Jimmy do 15 minutes. And I might put, um, be our guest, run, uh, and then tag. So my guys can look and go, okay, we're going to work on that song, we're going to run that song, we're going to learn a tag, okay, that's awesome, cool. Yep. And they can see how their night is budgeted, that way we've shown them, kind of this is what I have to pace my body for, this is what I'm working on. Uh, and it just kind of helps everyone all around to be able to keep honest to time schedule and pacing. Very cool. My course has taken to using uh, Groupanizer lately the past year or so, and, and it's been a, a great tool for me as a director to get my rehearsal plan done ahead of time and published on our Groupanizer page so they can know what to work on this week and they can know what to be prepared with and what and I, like Adam said, what uh, tunes are going to work on and have your music in the right order at the beginning of the rehearsal. It's been a great tool, but you can you know do it with email or however you like to do it. But uh, my my members certainly have had had begged me for years to uh, share with them that information ahead of time, and this has been very useful. Yeah, and some directors can be um, how do we say nicely disorganized, <laughs> um, scatterbrained. Mm -hmm. I'm sort of that way, so for me to have uh, a course manager 
take responsibility for the chorus and say, hey, these are the songs we're working on, this is the order we're working on them, and, you know, it just shows a, a better vote of faith and vote of confidence. So I can say, you know, I, I might have it really organized in my mind, but if I don't tell the guys that, then they get a little bit, you know, yeah. fancy, I guess. Yep. Scott and Russell, what, what's your uh, practice? What, what do you guys do from week to week as far as uh, telling folks what songs you're going to sing? Well, when we're starting new songs and uh, and working on ones that we don't really know terribly well, I will announce those uh, ahead of time, usually the week before, sometimes two weeks. Like We're, we're going to be uh, starting a new song in two weeks, so I've, I gave them a week's notice to do that. And yeah, we do run those songs early in the, uh, the evening, just like uh, Adam was saying, and then move on to things that we kind of know, and then things that we know really well. So we are following that. Good. Yeah, we definitely, uh, like you said, anything that we're really working hard on um, tends to be the first first bit of the evening. Um, our uh, assistant director usually puts together the schedule of what songs we're singing. Uh, we have co-directors because we just merged two choruses together. Mm. So both directors are currently co-directing. Yeah. And uh, uh, one disadvantage we have is that the other guy, um, well, he has a young family, and, you know, let's be fair about that. Uh, but he often comes, the director often comes in late. Like he'll be half an hour late to rehearsal or 45 minutes late if he had to drive his daughter somewhere or do something like that. Um, so if there's a song that he's working on, that might wind up being later in the rehearsal than we would like it to be. But apart from that, anything we're working on, yeah, it tends to be at the beginning. Um, our guys don't like just spending a night on two songs, um, although we did recently because we had a coach because our uh, division contest is coming up. So we had a coach in, um, and uh, she worked with just just the two songs, and uh, it was a, it was a good night. And they didn't they didn't seem to mind that just because you know it was a specific thing. And, yeah. And we had the coach and all that. Right. The exception yeah. than the rule. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, I know choruses, or I know of choruses that the whole you know month and a half before contest they work on two songs all night. Yeah. And uh, there's, there's no way our guys want to do that. There's no way I want to do that. That gets so boring. Yeah. So <laughs> sure. let's do something else. I know. So, yeah. Yeah, two-song syndrome can be tough. I mean, you you got to kind of be aware that, that there's a season for that and, and sometimes in some places. But that could be kind of tough and kind of uh, wearing and draining. If, if it's wearing and draining on me... It's wearing and draining on them. I, I kind of use them as my litmus test. Is this engaging and, and enriching for me? If there's a coach there, generally, yeah, I'm learning as much. I'm probably learning as much as they are. But if that's a week in, week out, I mean, there's there are a couple of songs that I hate with the fire of a thousand suns. I hate time you do your apron strings for no other reason than we spent. We just uh, I was in a chorus that just beat the holy crap out of that song. So I mean, that happens. Yeah. I actually sang that the first time I was in a quartet because the lead really loved it and wanted to sing this song. So, okay, we sang this song. Um, but I haven't sung it since. And the chorus I used to sing with now does probably 50% ballads in their wow. repertoire right now. Wow. And, and that's one of them. They did it in contests last year. And, uh, I mean, they did it well, but I'm thinking, man, I'm glad I'm not at their rehearsals anymore because... <laughs> No, I hear you. Yeah, fifty percent ballads. I kid you not. <laughs> so I remember having a conversation with Deke Sharon. He's kind of a recent acquaintance for me, and he said every every ensemble needs a good ballad. Yeah. Well, uh, oh, good ballad. Single ballad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I had. Uh, I had an. Uh, well, argument is a very strong word for what we were doing, but. Uh, I, I was talking with uh, one of the guys from that chorus, and I, I, I used to sing with the chorus, like I said, and every once in a while they'll still ask, can you just do up a script for us for this event we're doing? And so, yeah, fine, I'll type up a script. 
And they did, they sang for an hour, and um, I think there was somebody else singing, so they didn't do the whole thing. But I think they did, it was 15 songs, and seven of them were ballads. And I said, you know, half your stuff is ballads. And he said, oh, nothing wrong with that. I said, actually, I think there's a lot wrong with that. <laughs> but what are you going to do? Well, so I, I would give one point of, uh, of uh, acquiescence in the case that there's a tempoed ballad and there is the non-tempoed ballad, free ballad. So if you're going to look at um, someday when I'm awfully low and the world is you know that would be very obviously a free free tempoed ballad. But if if you had um, I don't mind being all alone. Da, 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 da. It's still kind of on the slow side. You might even make a case for it being a medium tempo piece. Mm -hmm. But there's, you know, or uh, are the stars out tonight? I don't know if you know, if you've got more some more obviously tempoed ballad than. Really, lyric isn't your driver. The tempo is your driver, and the and the rhythm becomes your driver. And so there's some case we made for that, but geez, I mean, when was the last time you went to a rock concert where they played 30% ballads? Yeah. When was the last time you went to, geez, even a church meeting? We get the point that tempo helps to drive things. Listen to the radio. Listen to really any radio station. In one hour count the tempoed songs versus the non-tempoed songs on any regular standard radio station, be it country, rock, whatever. You know, they're going to play probably in somewhere in the neighborhood of 70, 30, 80, 20 maybe of tempoed songs with some juice to them. Just because, you know, I guess what it's, it gets people moving. Think about it this way. The last time you went to uh, a bar in a, in a rowdy time, did they play any ballads at all? Maybe this is close to my mind because we went to my quartet went to a pub the other night uh, after a contest, and uh, not one. I mean, the entire thing was was up and loud and crazy, and then you face music because that was the environment they wanted. Now, is the concert that way? Is is the barbershop concert that way? No, not necessarily. But the the point is made that if you're going to sing a bunch of ballads, geez, that's a long concert. Mm -hmm. Now you're not going to go to a concert that plays nothing but Sousa marches because that would also be very strange. Uh, but you know you want to go to you want case in point. You want to be late with that. Very good, very good. Uh, any other follow up? Doc, what's your um, what's your pacing like at, at rehearsal as far as uh, tempoed pieces to to ballad pieces? I don't know if I can count that. I don't know if I could uh, qualify, quantify that. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, I wouldn't tend to do, personally, I wouldn't tend to do more than one, maybe two ballads a night. But we don't have that, we don't have that many in our repertoire to begin with, so it's, uh, it's sort of uh, proportional. I, I would I would uh, venture this last piece that I heard uh, James Estes once tell me because I was trying to to convince him to sing his quartet to sing one of my <laughs> one of my arrangements. He and it was a ballad. And he said, actually that was his first question. He said, "Is it a ballad?" I said, "Yep." He said, eh, "I got a waiting list for ballads. <laughs> ballads find you." He said, "Give me a tempo piece any day and we'll sing it. We're much more likely to sing it, but ballads find you." And those three words, it was like they really struck me. And I was like, oh, okay. So it was, it was then that I I stopped arranging so many ballads, and now I start arranging kind of like at least half and half, uh, because just necessity. Look at a look at a creature like Aaron Dale. That's pretty much all he does is he he arranges up tunes because that's what people are missing in the repertoire. Very true. Very true. Uh, think of the last time you found yourself singing a riveting Arendelle ballad. <laughs> nope. I cannot. Actually, by two quartets, we've picked up a bunch of...
to Berendale stuff lately, it seems, and he's directed the honors chorus this year at Harmony Youth. So uh, I'm learning three more of his songs, and none of them are ballads. Yeah. Hmm. Fancy that. <laughs> the honors chorus is doing four songs, three arranged by Aaron, and uh, Melancholy Baby, which is arranged by Mark Hale. Sort of. It's mostly keepsake. Okay. <laughs> anyway, yeah, great point. Hey, Adam, we got uh, just a few more minutes left. I wanted to pick your brain about uh, riser placement, voice placement on the risers. I know personally it's uh, springtime here in New England, and all of my snowbirds are coming back from Florida, and I've gained a couple new members, and it's about time to reshuffle the deck on the risers. Uh, tell, tell us how you, uh, or if you, and, and how you stack your singers and the risers, and if it's by sections or in shotgun, or how you blend them. What's that process like for you? That is such a great question, and I'm so pleased you asked it because uh, I think there's been so much talk and hype and discussion about riser placement, to use that word. Uh, I'm actually not fond of spending so much blood, sweat, and tears positioning Joe next to Frank, next to whoever, you know. I think we get much more out of riser positioning than necessarily riser placement. And I think it's because, particularly in larger choruses, we have to sandwich those little guys in there so close that we don't really have much choice. But in an ideal situation, you're going to stand about two feet apart. If you and I are going to stand shoulder length, uh, Eric, you and I are going to inevitably compete as to who can sing louder, longer, lower, or whatever. Yep. Uh, but if we stand about two feet apart, or basically I, I, I put my arm... Uh, out to my shoulder length, and if I can just put my fingertips on the next guy's shoulders, that's about how far apart I want to put my guys. Okay. Uh, in my chorus, I don't really care where my guys stand. I, I don't care if we stand in, sh in well, I generally stand in sections, but I don't really generally care where they stand on the risers. Who stands next to who, or this was my spot for, this is kind of like a church view. I sat on this pew for 20 years. Uh, I don't really care who stands by who. I do care when we start getting sandwiched in together, because then the the vocal product starts to become a little bit more shouty, and barbershoppers don't need help getting to the loud door. Uh, I think it's it's much more helpful for us to to make the make the plan, make the dynamic plan, make the vocal plans, and help us to stick to them if we're about two feet apart. Look at uh, Central Standard or uh, Westminster next time you watch them sing, and notice how far apart they stand. Sure. Yeah. Watch a YouTube link and 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 watch the difference between. Uh, the Masters of Harmony and and um, and the Westminster Chorus, and look how far apart Westminster Chorus is than uh, than Brothers in Harmony or or Chorus X. And generally speaking, that farther apart sound it doesn't make it so that I can't hear you, but it does make it so that w we stop fighting, we stop competing with each other on the risers, and we start listening more uh, because we're not just focused on on trying to quote unquote blend. We're just trying to sing and make the best vocal product we have. I think sometimes we can blend ourselves out of our best singing. Yeah, no idea. Oh, you said and, uh, sorry, to, to add one last piece into that, the academic research has is, shows much more uh, data and information and results on riser positioning than it does on placement. There have been dozens and dozens, if not hundreds, of studies done on placement, and the the results basically say, yeah, it doesn't really, it, it matters very little. They may make some modicum, small improvements here and there, but the vast majority of the research shows that riser positioning is much more effective than riser placement. Riser positioning meaning the space between seniors. That is fascinating. Yeah, not so much funny, but informative. <laughs> Very interesting. So you said you stand in sections. Uh, any particular way you like to put the, your sections? Generally, I put my uh, my tenors and my basses together, and my leads and my baritones together. Okay. Or are... I'll, I'll generally put my baritones on the left side, basses next, leads next, and tenors next. There's there's a couple of different ways to skin that cat. The theory being there's more tents. Uh, parallel tenths in the bass and tenors, and more third duets in the leads and baritones. And because the leads and the baritones are basically singing the same range, yep. that tends to be much more effective. Uh, the other, one other way to do it is to put the, the basses in the center as a bass wedge. Yep. 
with the leads around them, uh, the tenors next to that, and then the baritones down the hall, uh, right. outside the door, and in the street. <laughs> That's not fair. Perfect. <laughs> One thing that I think Shotgun does do is it forces you into part interdependence. And uh, if you have a song that you think your chorus is off paper on, say, uh, generally I will hold up both my hands and then kind of uh, run my fingers over the top of one another so it looks like my fingers are blurring. And that's kind of uh, Adam shorthand for shotgun or, or don't stand next to somebody who sings your part. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, that is a great way for the, my guys to checkpoint, do I really know this song or am I leaning on you know, the guy next to me? That's a great so tool. I think Shotgun is effective for that reason. It's a great tool. What I've, what I've started doing lately is, well, we're, we're small enough where we can get into a circle and still hear everybody. So after singing um, in our typical arrangement, I'll have everybody get in the circle and, and rearrange and sing like across the circle so you can hear. And uh, it's kind of shotgunny, but it works. No, it's brilliant, Scott. Yeah, we've tried that too. But we did one recently too where we, I had everybody stand up beside your part, so all around. And we took, um, we took Hello Mary Lou and sang it as a ballad. Ooh. So I said, you really have to think of your part because it was so hard for the guys to not just, you know, go to the next note. And when, you, when you're singing it like, pass me, bye, it's like, well, not that we were saying it like that, but it was a lot harder for them to remember their part, because it's an autopilot song, and as soon as they had to think, they realized how much they didn't necessarily know it, they just shot it out, but we heard some amazing chords in that song, there are actually chords in Mary Lou, we were shocked to learn that. <laughs> <laughs> how about that? I find the circle is also great for uh, not only for for listening, but for uh, visually uh, looking at the guy across from you in the circle. And I use it for my guys to you know try try and outsell the song for the from the guy across from you. So out 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 Paul Paul from across the row and see how much better you can do uh, visually for Paul and and challenge them that way. And I also do uh, I also do in a circle but turned around so backs in and make them listen that way. It's a great way to just Melt their melt their brains. I'm gonna write that one down. Yes, and then have them face in and say, "Okay, what'd you do differently?" Oh, we listened. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh. awesome. Funny you never suggested listening before. I <laughs> never would say that. Yeah, <laughs> but that's what started me on the circle, uh, getting arranged in the circle. Is I could tell they weren't listening to each other. Yeah, a great, uh, great tool for that. So, unless there are any other uh, quick follow-ups for Adam, or any other things you wanted to, to touch on, Adam? Uh, no, sir. No, thank you for the opportunity to uh, to meet with your guys again. I, I have a great love for the Northeastern District, and um, it was great to go up there and visit y'all. Um, despite it being colder than I can remember being. <laughs> I'll have you up in the summer sometime, sir. <laughs> well, that'd be lovely. Yes, very much. Uh, so speaking of lovely, coming up next month, uh, in May, at our next uh, CDB webinar, we're going to have Terry Ludwig, the director of Sound of Illinois, on their top 20 course. You've heard uh, for a few years of international now. Uh, Terry's going to be uh, teaching at directors uh, Harmony College Northeast in the director's track. Uh, he was on the cover of the Harmonizer a few months back, you may remember, uh, because his chapter, the Bloomington, Illinois chapter, and a few other area chapters went on this huge like bus tour and did, what, three states in three days or something. Uh, uh, very cool. Uh, and, and what I love about his philosophy is that uh, you can still have fun and still achieve excellence in this hobby. So uh, Terry's going to come and share some thoughts with us. Next month, that is not one to be missed. Uh, and then June, we have uh, Deborah Lynn, who's a, a local uh, teacher from the New England area, and she's going to come and talk specifically about uh, the, the aging voice and things we can do to uh, help the aging voices in our in our courses. Uh, I know 
some of you may not have any aging voices in your course, but they're the <laughs> oh, yes, we do. And, uh, okay, well, great. She's going to come and talk about that topic and uh, things we can do in warm-ups and in repertoire selection and things like that to, uh, to help uh, those folks who are uh, perhaps a few more years advanced than, uh, than me. <laughs> Uh, so that would be very informative, and I can't wait for that one, too. So uh, thank you again, Adam, for your time, and uh, thank your, your wife and kids for us, uh, for lend, loaning us to you for this hour, and uh, we'll see you all again soon. Yes, sir. See you in Nashville, Adam. Yes, you. sir. Okay, thanks. Cheers, Russell, Scott. Bye. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs>